So uh, thank you very much, uh, dear chairs and dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to be in this meeting today. Today the topic of my talk is treatment of CT glomerulopathy. So I would like to start with a patient from our outpatient clinic, uh, and we already reported it in nephrology journal. This is a 23 years old woman, a previously healthy woman, complaints of length swelling admitted to our hospital, and the physical examination revealed that this patient had bilateral mild pertibial edema. Then laboratory work was performed, and she had a high erythrocyte sedimentation rate with a high serum creatinine value, two milligrams per deciliter, and hypoalbuminemia. Then urine analysis performed and revealed that 10 red blood cells per high power field with a proteinuria, nine grams per day. And we want some antibody testing, and they are all neg negative. The serum complement levels were also normal. So we already performed an kidney renal ultrasonography, and since the urinary ultrasonography was normal, we just planned the kidney biopsy, and kidney biopsy was performed. It, had, uh, it showed seven glomeruli, and you can see the glomerular messenger hypercellularity with, and the capillary hypercellularity, and there are two glomeruli had crescents, and the immunophorous and staining showed an intense C3 glomerular deposits without any immunoglobulin deposits. So based on this histopathological findings, the C3 glomerulopathy was diagnosed. And at that time, we only have one report from a Spanish uh, group. And in this report, MMF plus three treatment was recommended. So we started prednisolone with MMF and ACE inhibitor treatment to our patient. However, unfortunately, two months later, she presented with shortness of breath. The physical examination re revealed three positive pretibial edema, and the lung auscultation findings are like hypervolemia, and the laboratory work uh, performed and serum creatinine value is 3.2 with thrombocytopenia, and we already have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which was confirmed with schistocyte on peripheral smear. Then, according to these results, we stopped the MMF, and at the TS 13 level was performed, the test was performed, and it was 30%. So based on these new findings, a atypical HUS was diagnosed in our patient, and before eclizumab treatment, we just performed five sessions of aphoresis with hemodialysis because of hypervolemia. And we already performed the genotyping test, and this test shows this common SNP is complement factor I, homozygous uh, single integrated polymorphism. And at the eight month of treatment, the, after eight months of eclizumab treatment, patients' serum creatinine value is around two, three to four milligrams per deciliter. The requirement for renal replacement treatment decreased once in a week. So this case report highlighted the common, the shared pathogenic mechanisms between these two diseases, CT glomerulopathy with atypical HUS. And when we look at this figure, if this, any patient has a mutation in the complement factor H gene uh, on, in the N-terminal side, so this patient may develop CT glomerulonephritis. And also another patient may have a mutation on the C-terminal side of a complement factor H gene, and he or she can develop a typical HGS. So this is an important finding which was known, and also another important finding. These two diseases can transmit each other. So uh, CT glomerulopathy patients can transmit, transit to a typical HGS or the other. So this can also occur after kidney transplantation. So these are both complement, complement related diseases. The complement system is, we know, it's a major uh, important part of innate immune system, and there are three main pathways. The first one is the classical pathway, which was started by the binding of antibody to the C1Q, and after that it generates its own C3 convertase, and the second one is the lectin pathway, with the mannose binding lectin binds to the carbohydrate sites on the cell surfaces of micropathogens, and it also has the same C3 convertase. On the other hand, there is another complement pathway, is the alternative pathway, which is always active in the body at a low level, and it also generates its own C3 convertase, and both of them makes C3 cleaves, C3 to C3A and C3P, which is the most important part of complement activation. So C3B 
is the most important factor for me because it can cause optimization and also it can cause the activation of membrane attack complex, C5B and 9. So there are some regulators and inhibitors of complement system like factor H and factor I. So what is happening in C3 glomeropathy is some dysregulation in the fluid phase level of alternative complement system. So if there is any dysregulation of this uh, C3 convertase or in, in other part of near close to this re region, so C3 base is over activated and it can also deposit in the kidney as you, uh, sorry, as you see here and this can cause C3 glomeropathy. However, if this complement dysregulation on the endothelial level, it can cause a typical HUS, as you see in the figure, if these uh, inhibitors didn't work or any other problem can cause dysregulation of complement activation, can cause a typical HUS. So, understanding the, the more detailed understanding of the complement system in MPGN, membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis, led to new classification of membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis. Now we classify this disease as immunoglobulin positive MPGN, which classical pathway is activated, or immunoglobulin negative MPGN, which, uh, which alternative pathway is activated. And there are some subgroups of this disease like C3 glomerulonephritis and dense deposit disease, and we diagnose it according to the electron microscopy findings. So I'm going to move on the treatment of C3 glomeropathy. This is the first report and an important report from Spanish glomerular disease group, the GLOSAN. So in this report, they, they evaluated 60 patients and within these patients, 40 are under immunosuppressive treatment. And as you see, Antoine are under non-immunosuppressive treatment and they have also a subgroup of MMF treated patients like that, as you see. And also, when you look at the baseline characteristics of these study groups, there are no significant differences. And very promising results and very interesting results, what they found that the clinical rem remission rates was significantly higher the patients under immunosuppressive treatment. And when you look at the MMF treated patients, the clinical remission rates is something like 86%. The median follow-up time is 47 months, and the MMF group, it is 44 months. What is very promising and a very nice result is, when you look at the Kaplan-Meier plots, you, you see that 100% renal survivor in patients under treatment. But what is interesting is that when you look at the follow-up month time, it ends on 14 months. But the median amount is 44 months, something like that. So it, it's, it's a little bit interesting. But the authors concluded that immunosuppressive treatment, particularly corticosteroids plus MMF, can be a beneficial drug or treatment option for patients with C3 glomerulonephritis. The second study comes from Turkey, from two well-known glomerular diseases centers, and we are also involved in this study. We evaluated 66 patients with CT glomeropathy, and the median follow-up time is 36 months. The mean age of patients was 36 and half of them, almost half of them are male. Patients are included with a follow-up time of more than one year. Uh, what do you see? We also certified our patients under MMF treatment, non-MMF treatment, and conserv conservative treatment patients. And as you see in the MMF group, our patients had more proteinuria compared to other groups. And also the serum albumin levels are less in our MMF treated patients compared to other treatment groups. And also, regarding the histopathological uh, characteristics of our patients, when you see there is no significant difference uh, regarding the histopathological factors, but if you look detailed, you can see that interstitial fibrosis is a little bit higher in the, the MMF-treated groups, which is not statistically significant, and also the rate of crescents is higher in the uh, MMF-treated patients compared to others, but these are not statistically significant. What they, we found that the complete remission rates, also the partial remission rates, were similar with, between groups. As you see, the MMF treated patients, 40, and the non MMF 30, and the other one is 18. I know it looks like different, but the statistical signif there is no statistical significance when you uh, look at the uh, statistical analysis. And when we had the Kaplan Meyer analysis, the plots, you can see that all three groups are. Is similar to each other, and when we certify the patient groups as conservative group and immunosuppressive treatment group, the results are also similar. 
And we also try to find the predictors of renal failure, but we found that the patients, as we expected, with a lower EGFR, higher proteinuria, higher percentage of crescents, and higher sclerotic glomeri had worse outcomes. And uh, we also genotype, perform genotyping to our patients, 17 patients, and what we found that common complement factor H is SNPs and also complement factor I SNPs, and these are the common SNPs that we found. And interestingly, compared to the co uh, control groups, uh, in this group, the patients with complement factor I SNPs had more worse disease reach primary outcome, which is uh, at the limit, like p-value of 0.05. The third study came from U.S. Columbia University, and we, all, we, all, uh, we were also involved in this study. This, they had 120 C3 glomerulopathy patients, and 33 of them under MMF, and 43 of them under non-MMF treatment. So they just follow patients under MMF treatment, uh, and after three months, they included them in the study. What they found, three patients were uh, excluded during the this period, three months, because of diarrhea and geodema or leukopenia. They certify their patients like responders and non-responders. As you see, this is respond to MMF. And you can say that the patients with lower proteinuria, they were based on lower protein, uh, they was our response more compared to other group. This is, is expected. Also, they found that the patients with MMF and corticosteroid treatments uh, had better remission rates, as you see, and better complete remission rates compared to other immunosuppressive treatments and also conservative treatment. So after that, another option for C3 glomeropathy regarding the treatment can be complement inhibitors. And now we have one commercially available complement inhibitor, eculizumab inhibitor, and also we have some promising complement inhibitors like TP10 and CP40, which are C3 inhibitors. So there are some several case reports in the literature about eclizumab, which was effective in C3 glomerulopathy. This is the only study that I can find from the French court, included 26 patients. These patients were first received steroid, aphrasis, and immunosuppressive treatment. Then they administered eclizumab treatment, and three of them uh, progressed the end-stage renal disease. Almost half of the patients are CKD patients, seven of them, 27% of them are RPG and repeated progressive form, and there are three patients under uh, renal replacement treatment. They administered eclizumab for 14 months. The remission rates are as follows, 23 complete remission, 23% partial remission, and half of them didn't uh, reach the remission. What they found that the patients with complete remissions has lower EGFR based on EGFR levels, progressive course, and active, active disease. And they concluded that you can use eclizumab as a potential treatment in the rapidly progressive form of C3 glomerulopathy. So based on some of these studies, the KDGO group, the expert group, recommended some recommendations for the treatment of C3 glomerulopathy, which was published in 2017. And first, they recommend all patients the optimum blood pressure control, ACE inhibitor treatment, angiotensin receptor blockers, optimal nutrition and lipid control. Also, they certify their patients as a moderate disease and severe disease, and the moderate disease described as patients with a protein real level higher than 500 milligrams per 24 hour, or recent increase in serum creatine or moderate inflammation biopsy, and they recommend MMF plus prednisone treatment to these patients. The other group is patients with severe disease, and they describe this patient group as despite immunosuppressive treatment, and supportive treatment, if the patient has a protein urea level, urea level more than two grams, severe inflammation, or high serum creatinine levels, these patients was identified as or described as severe disease patients. And unfortunately, there are no good recommendations. If these patients have severe disease, you can use metoprednisolone pulse treatment or anticellular immunosuppressive treatment, but this has, these treatments had limited success in this rapid progressive form of glomerulonephritis. And also, data is insufficient to recommend eclizumab as a first-line treatment for these patients. So 
Another important issue, as we know, now C3 glomerulopathy was reported that associated, associated with monoclonal immunoglobulin diseases. So this is an important finding. If you had a patient, an older patient with C3 glomerulopathy, you have to think about monoclonal immunoglobulin associated diseases. So in this patient, there are 50 patients and there are three treatment groups, chemotherapy against the B cell functions and other immunosuppressive treatments, and also patients under rust brokers. And interestingly, these patients had underlying hematological dis disorders like monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance, smoldering myeloma, or symptomatic myeloma, or CLL. And what they found is chemotherapy is effective treatment for monoclonal gammopathy associated C. glomerulopathy. So what are the take-home messages? In conclusion, there is substantial overlap in the pathogenesis of C3 glomerulopathy and atypical HUS, and transitions between these alternative pathway-associated diseases may occur. MMF plus 3 can be an option for treatment of C3 glomerulopathy. A lower age of onset, higher proteinuria, lower EGFR at biopsy, or higher crescent crescenting and sclerotic glomeruli or higher severity of interstitial fibrosis can predict progression to end-stage renal disease. Eculizumab is a potential treatment for rapidly progressive form of C3 glomerulopathy. However, the response to eculizumab is heterogeneous. Rapid and efficient chemotherapy has the potential to remit renal damage in monoclonal gammopathy associated C3 glomerulopathy. Sorry. And randomized controlled trials evaluating the new treatments agents like C3 inhibitors are needed. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Any questions from the room? Uh, if not, I would ask. Uh, sure. uh, do you have any experience with the treatment of uh, monoclonal gammopathies with C3GN with uh, rituximab? Uh, so, actually, I don't have any experience of rituximab, but they, I know they already use it. And also in this study with uh, <coughs> uh, B-cell treatments, uh, they put it in the other group, other immunosuppressive treatment group. And when they look at the results, the bortezomib group is much better than the rituximab, rituximab group. Yeah, I presume it depends on the main, di main diagnosis. Yeah, For example, in our cohort, we have a lady with uh, Waldenstrom, <coughs> definitely <coughs> treated with rituximab, rituximab with oh. much success. Okay. Thank you. Could I uh, ask, with a complement-mediated problem, how does um, mycophenolate and prednisone switch that process off? So that, that's what I am thinking, the same thing. So it is recommended that MMF is, uh, is a good treatment for complement-associated diseases, but what is the mechanism? I think they think that it could be associated, can, I read their discussions and it's written like that, it lowers the antibody levels. But antibody levels to what? Complement or something? But they suggest this mechanism for the action of MMF. Thank you very much. I have two questions. One is, um, is there any information on how best to handle this situation in recurrence post-transplant? Okay. Second question is, uh, is there any noted association with malignancy? Thank you very much. So the first question, this is another important issue. We, rec we recommend this patient's MMF, but we use MMF in the, under uh, renal transplantation, and this patient's recur after, after transplantation. That's true. So we use sometimes eculizumab for these patients based on the electron microscopy uh, findings. We can use eculizumab in these patients. And the second question, uh, the malignancy, as I said, we have to think about monoclonal gammopathy associated malign malignancies uh, particularly in this patient's C3 glomeropathy. Okay. Thank the you last question from Mike Four. I'm Amir Sabaka from Spain. My question regards also treatment with mycophenolate. Since we're not addressing the complement problem, uh, and there, are, there is very little evidence on recurrence after uh, discontinuing treatment, uh, what's the duration of treatment that you would recommend for patients who have uh, gained the uh, complete remission or partial remission? So, I have no recommendation for that because, you know, in our group, we didn't find any beneficial effect of MMF. What was, was reported before, these patients are, un, uh, un, I think, under more than 20 months, 25 months me median treatment, and they found, the Spanish group found uh, a very good results under this treatment, more than 25 months, more than two years, something like that. 
Thank you. Thanks very much, Sar. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so I'd like to invite the first of our free communications. So, um, um, so the first of our free communications is in fact the last on your programme. So it's Laura Van Dam, who's from Leiden, and she is going to present her work on the effect of B-cell targeted therapies on autoantibodies and excessive neutrophil extracellular trap formation in 